welcome. This is a very special one and I'm so glad to see a lot of you because uh, <clears throat> America has gone and jumped the gun and sprung forward and we haven't in the rest of the world. So hopefully we've caught up with you and we're, we're um, ready with you at the same, at the right time. So uh, special event today, especially for me, because it's very close to my heart. The first time I came across Phil Alexander was as a boy uh, who was in the Gregory Schechter's Klezma Festival Band, which we created in 1981 as the first Klezma Band in the UK. And there was this young keyboardist who eventually came to play with, with Gregory. And so many of the British players were uh, a core, a kernel in that band. And of course, Ilana is the Joe Loss lecturer in Jewish music at SOAS. And this is something that we were so pleased to be able to create together with the professor of music first at City University to have a lectureship in Jewish music in a mainstream university. So that was something so special. Alexander Knapp, who's probably here somewhere, was the first uh, incumbent. After that was uh, um, Abigail Wood, who's going to be on a session next month. And now we have the wonderful Ilana Webster Kogan, who is loved by all the students and all the professors and everybody at SOAS. So it's lovely that they're connected together and they will explain how they are connected together. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Ilana, who is the Joe Loss lecturer, who's going to lead the session today. Ilana. Great, thank you so much, Geraldine. Um, I, I should note, I do, I do teach uh, Jewish music, but I should note that I am not the most qualified person called Ilana to talk about Klezmer in this Zoom room, which is extremely public. Um, well, so I'm really, truly delighted to be here. Um, I've known Phil for 10 years. Phil was my very first student at SOAS, actually. Phil started doing his master's um, just as I took Abby's place um, 10 years ago. And within about 30 seconds, I recruited Phil, you must do a PhD. And he did. And he amazingly quickly managed to turn it into a book with Oxford Unity University Press, no less. And he has a British Academy Fellowship. He's an early career researcher um, in Scotland. Um, he's made us, he was the, he was the first uh, Joe Loss PhD, um, uh, the, the first Mildred Loss studentship that I took on as a PhD supervisor. So um, he, he, he makes Jennifer Jankel, who's here, and Geraldine and me brim with naches. Um, and this new book is really quite an achievement because it is um, groundbreaking in a lot of ways. Um, I'm so, so pleased to be able to, to host this event with him. So if I can um, thank everyone for joining us, including some former SOAS students who I notice have come into the room, which is great, and lots of instrumental teachers at SOAS. Um, thank you everyone for, for offering your support. And as I understand it, many musicians who Phil has worked with in his, um, in his in his research and of course um the the stalwart gill who makes all of our work so much easier at the jmi so um if we can introduce phil i can't i can't see phil maybe i will i will pin there's phil great hi phil well um congratulations congratulations on the book um thank you very much yeah um phil finished his phd in 2016 and having a book with oup five years after completing your phd is um a pretty pretty Herculean task. I don't know many people who have managed to do that. So it's, I, I, it would have been, a, it would have been a huge accomplishment, even if it came out five years from now, but especially the fact that it was such a great thesis that it was ready to be published in the, in the form that it was. Well, I, I might add that was under your um, aegis there. You, one of the things that you recommended to me was to write with an idea for publication, not just with an idea for the PhD. So maybe uh, you put in some of the work there to start with. 
Maybe I did, but it helps that you're a fantastic writer. I think anyone who has had the pleasure of reading Phil's writing knows that it's really a great pleasure. I recommend the book because Phil's writing is really, really excellent. If you don't know if an academic book on Klezmer is for you, that shouldn't put you off the book. So, um, so Phil and I are going to have a conversation about the book and we're going to start with um, with with material that, that, that I know quite well because uh, I've been involved in the process, but I think it's a wonderful story how, how the book has come about and the process that brought this book into into the world. So Phil, why don't you just start us off? Tell us, um, so Sounding Jewish in Berlin, it's out with weeks, weeks, in, it, it's only been in bookstores for a few weeks. So tell us, how did the book make its way into the world? Where did you get the idea for the project? And what what were the, the things that you did to, 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 to make this happen? Well, it kind of began, as you said, it began at SOAS. Um, I had been a musician. Um, working musician for many years and had this kind of urge to be academing a little bit more to expand my um, knowledge and my mind a little bit and various circumstances meant that that was possible round about 2010 something like that um, and I had a conversation with Abby Wood uh, your predecessor at SOAS and I didn't have my it turned out that I wanted to do a PhD and I didn't have much of an idea about what I wanted to do a PhD in um, and Abby very quickly sussed this and said really I think you should go and do a master's at which point then I was able to uh, learn from you learn from some other people at SOAS um, learn the value of honing an idea learn that kind of general feelings are all very well but what you actually need is a clearly directed idea and in a sense the idea of studying um, Klezmer in Berlin was slightly opportunistic because it brought together two things that I um, am a big fan of, Klezmer music and the city of Berlin. But I was also interested in the fact that it seemed that this story had only really ever been told in one way, which was a very kind of binary, antagonistic German-Jewish paradigm. Um, and, you know, we might get into this a bit later. There was often a sense that the narrative was about um, is this German guilt? Um, what are all these non-Jews doing playing klezmer? And I, I didn't want to discount that um, context, but at the same time, it seemed to me there must be another story that one could tell about this. Um, so, you know, really, with your help as my supervisor for that first year, I managed to hone that argument a bit. Um, and uh, I remember once how you were in, uh, I think you were in um, Abu Dhabi, and I had to write an email that contained lots of contain the word Jewish or Jew lots of times and apparently that was going to get like thrown out by your email server so I used old rhyming slang instead and uh, which is five by two so I wrote about a lot of fiveies um, which <laughs> about fivey weddings and the fivey uh, community of Berlin anyway um, so uh, there I was in Berlin um, a year of field work and you know you're always at the mercy of the historical moment and I, that was the moment that I arrived in Berlin. As it turned out, it was a fantastically serendipitous one, which we can talk about in a bit, because some new klezmer spaces opened. It became clear to me that there was a kind of shift um, in the geography of the city, the musical geography of the city, particularly moving from Prenzlauberg in the east to Neukölln in the south. Um, and that was a kind of generational shift. Also, at the same time, there was an incredible concert series going on, curated by Dan Kahn and others, uh, called the Klezmer Bund series, which was really like a presented me an array of uh, klezmer and Yiddish musical activity in the city over that year. So I went with this, you know, with a plan and then quickly learned that plans change. And so I guess we can talk a bit about how that plan changed next. But maybe just before we do, this might be a really lovely chance, seeing as there are so many of them here, to publicly thank um, the musicians who I met and uh, was lucky enough to interview and play with while I was there over that year. So, I mean, there's there's a number here. There's Alan Byrne, of course, who kind of looms large in any uh, klezmer discussion. Um, who else have we got? We've got Ilya Schneves, who uh, is on the cover um, of the book. Um, I know that Sasha Luria is here as well. Uh, Patrick Farrell and Sveta Kundish, um, and, uh, and their third, their new new baby, are here as well. So I'd like to just really, you know, say thanks to them for... Uh, for their incredible input.
Um, Phil, if I can add one other thing, there's a funny one on here. Uh, Mark Slobin is here. Phil, do you remember when you were doing your master's oh, and were just getting the, the, you were just getting your proposal together and Mark Slobin, you came to SOAS and gave a research, a, 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 a talk at our research seminar. And I came over and introduced Phil to you afterwards and said, Phil is thinking about writing a PhD about Klezmer in Berlin. And Mark, you said, that's a great idea. And we said, great, we're <laughs> gonna go for it. Mark Slobin says, it's a good idea. We're going to do it. Um, and now it's, a, now it's a book. So there you go. Um, Okay, well, Phil, can, why don't we um, tell us a little bit about the book's main arguments? There are some some of the some of a lot of it is presented in case studies. Some of them are really really evocative music writing that could fit very well into a music magazine, stuff like the Neukölln Sessions, for example. So why don't you tell us um, tell us a little bit about what the main the, the main arguments of the book are and how you how you drew the kinds of conclusions that you that you drew? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I'd say the main, the central thrust of the book uh, as a whole is to try to understand what happens um, to traditional music in the contemporary city. What happens when, uh, you know, the traditional music is confronted by the contemporary city? Um, how does it have to change, but also how does it affect and in some way produce that city? What is this kind of symbiotic relationship that's going on there? Um, and so that really that's the central thrust that guided um, my whole analytical perspective, which was, as you know, try to avoid drawing lines between an object of study as in music and context of the city, rather thinking about this as music of a city, but music of the city as well, and then seeing how that worked. And, and the way I chose to do that, to, to split it up, was to look at performer networks, um, and that allowed me to talk quite a lot about musical style as well that was going on, historical style and also contemporary uh, musical practice. Um, then I was looking at uh, musical spaces um, and how music, uh, klezmer and Yiddish music is producing certain spaces and is creating a certain different forms of spatial practice. Um, and again, I think we'll talk about that in a minute if I go on about the Neukölln Klezmer sessions. Uh, I also looked at how the city of Berlin is kind of made meaningful in some particular musical examples, particularly the work of someone like Dan Kahn, who chooses to uh, kind of confront that at times problematic German Jewish history head on and thus makes the city very much part of his aesthetic. Um, and I also looked, uh, I looked at a couple of uh, a really interesting project called Sema, um, well, it's now called Semmer Ensemble. It began life as Semmer Label Reloaded, which uh, kind of recreates the music um, of 1930s uh, Berlin uh, Jewish uh, record labels and recreates that for a modern concert audience and brings together a number of the people who are very active on this scene at the moment. And I also looked at a really, a really important part, much more important than I realised it was going to be part of the story, which happens out with Berlin, but feeds directly into it, which is uh, the influence of Yiddish summer Weimar. Um, under the stewardship of Alan Byrne and how that, you know, what is learned and disseminated and kind of discussed at Weimar feeds back into the operations of the city. So those were my kind of large paradigms. And all of the, all of the time that was about looking at the relationship between the city and the music. So trying to understand what is it about the city that uh, affects this traditional music and how does that kind of play back into the wider musical circles that are going on. Um, and maybe as a nice place to start, uh, because it was possibly the moment when I realised this was a great time to be looking at this music in Berlin, would be to talk a little bit about the Neukölln Klezmer Sessions, uh, which began while I was there, um, and excuse me, which was at the end of 2013. Um, and maybe we can, I'm going to play a little bit of music, a play a very, a very ethnographic <laughs> video that I took um, and read a little description in a minute, but maybe let's just contextualize those sessions a bit. Um, they're not the first Klezmer Jam session in the city. Uh, the first Klezmer Jam session was set up in about 1995 um, by a number of people who are still active on the scene and that's called the Klezmer Stammtisch. And that was very long running. It ran until about 2018. And it was in uh, somewhere between Mitte and Prenzlauerberg uh, in a lovely, beautiful wood panelled um, Berlin pub called Café Oberwasser. And that was for many years really an important 
focus and uh, kind of hub of connectivity for a lot of particularly German klezmer musicians, but also international ones, anyone visiting the city, to meet and to exchange tunes, exchange tunes and to play. Um, it became apparent, certainly talking to people while I was there, that there was something of a, quite a formalized environment at Oberwasser. It was, it was wonderful and warm and welcoming, but it was quite a sort of formal music making process for a jam session. And in fact, the, the session organizers were aware of this. Um, one of my friends, Stefan Litscher, showed me a list of uh, kind of fake rules that they had compiled at the end of the 90s for the, uh, for the Stammtisch. And it was, some of it was good session sense. It was things like, if you can't hear yourself, you're playing too loud. Um, and then a lot of it was tongue in cheek, like no more than three trumpets allowed at any one time. Or if you start a piece of music, try and get through at least once before you abandon it, this kind of thing. So the, the Klezmer Stammtisch's uh, founders and people that were um, keeping it going were aware of this tension between a sort of propriety and, you know, unbridled musical joy. Um, but I would say that newer arrivals to the city perhaps felt that tension a little stronger. Uh, there was another um, in around about 2010, one of the original Stammtisch founders, uh, Matthias Groh, uh, started a kind of curated jam session, also in Prenzlauberg in the East. Um, and that's called Satam's Lounge, which I believe is still going in some form or other. It's had a few uh, different venue changes over the years. Um, and that was uh, a really, again, a really lovely hub of connectivity and a chance to make connections. And certainly I made some good connections there, but it was an invited curated jam session. So anyone could sign up, anyone could participate, but you couldn't just turn up. You had to sign up on a list and then you would be kind of organized by Matthias into different groups. So in that sense, it was um, there was some kind of gatekeeping control at work. Now, both of these spaces were in Prenzlauberg, which in the 1990s, famously in Berlin, offered uh, cheap rent for a kind of uh, bohemian, quite radical uh, community of artists and musicians and things like that. Uh, by the time I was there and even earlier, Prenzlauberg uh, had become more or less wholly gentrified um, and really was not offering those same sort of opportunities to younger arrivals to the city. Um, and in a sense, so all of those, that kind of newer generation has moved and they've moved often south to Neukölln, which uh, is still, you know, like so many uh, cool areas of, of global cities is at risk from gentrification and at risk from people coming in, you know, to be part of the brand of Berlin cool. Uh, but it still offers, even now, offers reasonably priced accommodation and a kind of thriving street culture um, and certainly uh, the sort of freer end of artistic uh, connectivity that Prenzlauerberg was in the 1990s. So we see a shift in, uh, in geography there. Um, and the, there's a few other differences with this Neukölln Klezmer session. Um, first of all, the three people who founded it, that's Ilya Schneves, uh, Hampus Mellin and um, Emil Goldschmidt, uh, none of them is from the city. Um, Ilya's from Riga, Emil's from uh, Copenhagen, uh, and Hampus uh, is from Malmö in Sweden. And two of them, Ilya and Emil, had only fairly recently made Berlin their home when they arrived. So this is very much a much more internationalist kind of outlook. Um, and they talked a lot. I know that in discussion, I mean, Ilya's on this, this uh, Zoom, so he can maybe correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong. But certainly I got the feeling talking to Emil and Hampus that there were quite a lot of discussions about how the room should be set up and how one could achieve a much more kind of fluid, uh, what I talk about quite a lot in the book, an unofficial space of musical practice. Um, so there was a lovely quote from Hampus about we wanted it to be like you couldn't really tell whether someone was playing and actually you could kind of melt into the sound and melt out and you, you think, well, is that person playing? Are they, maybe they're playing a little bit. And I think that's lovely, uh, unofficial, non-formalized space of music making that was going on uh, in uh, in Oblomov. So, so I'm going so to... So if I can interrupt you, um, yeah. I know the evidence that you provided in your thesis, you've got lots of audiovisual evidence of that of that dynamic. Could you Could you show us a little bit of it, please? I want to do two things. I want to read... Um, of my a description and then I'm going to play a little bit of film if that's okay. Uh, so the description is an amalgam of two field notes uh, from the first and the second sessions. In truth the first session was much quieter but it still had a real sense of, of difference that was going on. So I'm going to read this. Um, these Throughout the whole book I, I used my field notes as quite a sort of um, journalistic 
uh, way of understanding this music. So it's uh, it's written with that in mind. So I'm going to read this with, with your indulgence. Here we go. Um, OK. A wailing clarinet, rolling snare drum and chugging accordion spill out onto the cold street and it sounds good. It fits, like hearing the strains of Charlie Parker coming up from a 52nd Street cellar sometime around the late 1940s. Except this is not jazz or punk or reggae. It's klezmer music, traditional dance music for Jewish weddings. And it's not a reworked, modernised klezmer either. Beats, loops and cross-genre mashups are only noticeable by their absence. Yet it sounds like it means business. The musicians are mostly arranged at one end of the room, but there's no clear border or stage. Players spill into the audience, boundaries overlap and are continually redrawn as people move around the room or in and out of the music makers to say hello or join in. Several singers and players have opted to stay within the bulk of the crowd and by the end of the evening we'll all have become performers in a lusty Gute Nacht sing-along. Musicians come and go from the stage end, slipping into the bar to buy drinks, into the audience to chat to friends. Places change, fiddle players stand and their seats are taken by accordionists. A darabuka player moves into the middle of the room, a trumpeter shyly appears on the couch to the left. The leader, Ilya, stands, sits, jigs around whilst playing. And as people join in, they mostly do so from their audience position, along the walls, at tables, strolling with a guitar. Plus we're all singing and dancing, at least some of the time. At half time we congregate in the noisy, smoky and lighter main bar. Hugs and handshakes, quick chats and catch-ups, drinks ordered and cigarettes smoked. Then everyone messily heads back into the dark room next door. There are now many more people and the second half begins with an introduction from Ilya and Hampus, a manifesto about bringing klezmer to where younger musicians now lives. Someone in the crowd cheers, first we take Neukölln. A little awkward, a little self-conscious, but its sentiment and intention are active and inclusive. The night reminds me of what so many people have told me, that most of the people who are into the klezmer scene here are also participants. Here there are singers, musicians, Weimar alumni, and the line between performer and audience is impossible to draw. Every other conversation is about how great this first night has turned out. Sasha and Dan sing a couple of songs from their upcoming Gorky Theatre gig, a concert performance around a bar table. They sing Yes Liu Vas, a Soviet New Year favourite sung in Russian and Yiddish by a 30-something Latvian and American to a bunch of Berlin musicians 20 years after the fall of communism. Olaf and Tanya follow with Ich will euch geben zu der Klauen, and we all join in with the Yabba boys. There's dancing, clapping, hat glasses banged on tables, lots of shouting. It's a noisy and happy party of new and old friends. It's also very cool, not sunglasses, casinos and celebs cool, but relaxed, enjoyment over image. A crowd of youngish, hip, but not achingly so Berliners, all singing and dancing to klezmer and Yiddish music without a trace of self-consciousness or awkwardness or learnt behaviour. At one point I step outside for some fresh air. Looking through the steamed up window, I realise that if I couldn't hear, perhaps the last thing that I would expect the soundtrack to be is early 20th century Yiddish folk music. So I hope that's, you know, writing about music, dancing and about architecture and all that, but I hope that gives you some kind of sense of, uh, of, the, uh, yeah, of the fluidity and the enjoyment. I'm going to play um, a minute or so of film now. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a bit of context. This was shot in the dark on my phone um, and so you know please make allowances for that but as you're looking look at the kind of degree of fluidity that's going on look at that it's hard to see who's performing and who's listening it's hard to know exactly where those lines are drawn. Um, you also it's uh, I'm shooting the film from the musician's kind of end of the room and you can't see very far to the back but if you could see further back you would see lots of people also singing, swaying, dancing, holding hands, basically doing all the things that we're not allowed to do right now. Um, so I will play this film and uh, I hope you enjoy it and I hope it brings back some memories for those people who were there. You might want to turn up, uh, if you've got control on your, on your screen, you might want to turn up the brightness and the volume because both of those are a bit minimal on this. Uh, yes, ev um, everyone, don't, you don't need to worry that it's your eyesight that's bad. It's a <laughs> Berlin club, so that's very much uh, the aesthetic. <laughs> I'm afraid so. Here we go.
to get to the key change to give you an idea of the uh, the kind of immediate um, musical arrangement uh, that was going on there and I was uh, it was nice to see Ilya and Sasha's faces while watching that as well um, so I hope that gives you some some sense of that so the book um, is uh, you know is looking at those kind of of spaces um, it's also looking at I mean, that's very much what was going on while I was there. I, it's really important to understand that doesn't spring from nowhere. There is a, a klezmer and Yiddish musical history to the city of Berlin, which I also talk about in some detail. And that, you know, not not pre-war, that's that's for another another musicologist, really. But certainly from post-war, so looking at the work of uh, Lynn Yaldati, uh, that's uh, Yalda Rebling's uh, mother. Some of you uh, who are COS attendees will know um, will know Yalda. So that's the work of her mother and her father, Eberhard Rebling, and the uh, kind of Yiddish song as um, almost ambassadors for the East German state, the work that they did. And then in the West, um, looking a little bit at the work of people like Peter Roland, who was using uh, Yiddish song in a kind of folk singer aesthetic, in much the same way that someone like Pete Seeger uh, would have been doing. Um, and then uh, in the West from the 1960s, we have the band Kazbek, who started picking up uh, balalaikas in, uh, you know, and playing around Russian bars and then are still going now over half a century later. And then also, and they, this next group forms quite an important part of the book, um, the kind of pioneers of Yiddish and Klezmer musical practice, certainly in East Berlin. Uh, from the 1980s, which is people like Karsten Troika and the band Aufwind, who uh, were kind of picking up on a on a resurgence and a renewed interest in uh, traditional Ashkenazi Jewish folk music, but unlike um, American counterparts, were doing it with very very limited resources. Were kind of piecing together what they could find, and the result is that their music has its own sort of aesthetic, um, which is slightly different, I would argue, from uh, from more recent klezmer musical practice. Um, and uh, so I talk a bit about them, and then also talking more recently about musicians, German musicians, such as uh, Christian David, and, uh, well, Santa Monica is Dutch, but has been in Berlin for a long time, Fabian Schnedler, the late uh, Franka Lampa, who were learning their klezmer built on the kind of researches that were going on at uh, Klez Camp and the work of uh, someone like Alan Byrne at Yiddish Summer Weimar. So there's those kind of topics as well. Um, can I do one more bit about Yiddish Summer Weimar before you ask your next question, Ilana, or do you want to? I think ask? everyone wants to hear about Yiddish Summer Weimar, but we also want okay. to give you a break at some point to catch up on the chat because people have, are having very fond memories in the chat. Um, <laughs> some some about, about Bar Oblomov, some about people not wearing masks in the club, et cetera. Oh, don't. Uh, Tell in me general, about it. Ilya, Ilya seems to recall exactly as you're describing it. Um, but so, yes, please tell us about, about Weimar. Well, it would be worth mentioning, especially as Alan is here. Uh, we, Alan can see my take on it, and uh, you know, uh, actually, my take is is very heavily informed by uh, the wonderful, you know, remarkable and wide-ranging philosophy of Alan Burns. So, 
I'm thinking he won't disagree too much. But what struck me that was interesting about Yiddish Summer Weimar is, first of all, the connection between that and uh, Berlin musical practice. So what's, as I said, what's learnt and disseminated at Weimar feeds back into the city of Berlin. A lot of the, I would say, almost all the um, protagonists, um, certainly uh, since the you know, since the early 2000s, people who've been active since the early 2000s uh, maintain, in the city maintain a close relationship with uh, with Alan and with Yiddish Summer Weimar. So the, it's a very much a kind of iterative, it's a dialogue going on there. Um, and I think a number of things struck me about Weimar. Um, first of all, the name. Let's just think about that name for a second. Uh, Yiddish Summer Weimar. This is like three very powerful signifiers all piled on top of each other and there's no helpful um, you know uh, there's no helpful conjunctions or anything like that so you have summer so it's temporarily rooted you have Weimar which is uh, geographically rooted and you know and Weimar is in in German historical geography we're talking about a city which of course gave its name to the interwar republic it's the adopted home of uh, national poets goethe and schiller it was the birthplace of the bauhaus but also an early adopter of nazism so weimar itself is a kind of you know is a powerful signifier for german history um, and then into that you add the word yiddish and i want to read you a wonderful quote from alan i have three quotes of alan's i'd like to read that are in the book. He's, Alan, you're very well represented generally in the book, um, but I have three fantastic quotes. Um, and I'm going to start with this one, uh, which I think is lovely. So this is Alan talking about what happens when you, you put the word Yiddish into that, into that mix. Um, and he says, the reason why Yiddish culture maybe has a bit more potential for that, talking about um, kind of provocation, uh, is because of the history of Jews in Germany. Jews in Germany, before the arrival of Syrian and Iraqi immigrants, were a special kind of other, and actually they still are. So that means that somebody who has that in their background, and that's there in German culture, when they come to Yiddish Summer Weimar, that's already a step into the confrontation of that whole history, which is different than if I say it's Jazz Summer Weimar. So it's sort of like, if we think of this whole thing as like a nice charcoal fire or something like that, the Yiddish part of it is like the starter fluid that makes it explode right away, which I love. And I think that's very, uh, very kind of perceptive. Uh, you know, it doesn't skirt the issue, but it, it allows an engagement with that history. What struck me, though, about the processes of Weimar, I'll just talk very quickly about them, um, is that uh, the kind of the decision making process of Yiddish summer Weimar um, is a very fluid kind of organic process. And it's what you might call a deep learning environment. The learning goes on um, at the edges as much as within the formalized structures of, uh, you know, of workshops and um, of lectures and things like that. And again, this is a really kind of important uh, part of the aesthetic because it promotes um, a sense of collectivity and a sense of mutual uh, reliance, which I think is really important. And it's really important to see Yiddish musical culture in that context. And I'm going to read you one more thing from Alan which kind of explains the thinking behind that because I asked him like is this a conscious choice because I had I had done some questionnaires from my time I was there for a couple of weeks in, in 2014 and I'd done some questionnaires from fellow participants and a lot of people picked up on the the looseness of process of Yiddish Summer Weimar and found it very empowering um, and very inclusive some people not at all some people said basically I thought people were, I thought the teachers were winging it you know, I thought they were making it up as they went along and I didn't, I wanted something more structured. And I was asking Alan about this and he said, that's fine. That's the point is to include those different, sometimes oppositional perspectives. Um, and this is, was his kind of um, uh, rationale. Uh, he said, prejudices cannot be overcome by arguments. They have to be overcome by experiences that are deep enough in someone's existence. And so I thought, well, that means we should spend less time in Yiddish Summer Weimar talking about cliches and prejudices and anti-Semitism and so forth. More time putting people in situations which have enough insecurity that they have to kind of find their way through it. They're going to feel that they trusted someone they shouldn't have trusted or that someone they didn't trust was actually trustworthy or someone that they thought they had nothing in common with. Five days later, they feel like they've got shared experiences. And that has transformative potential. And, and I agree with that. And I think when you see Yiddish musical culture into that environment, it shows the malleability um, of, uh, you know, of something which is often framed in a much more uh, kind of restrictive heritage uh, context. 
So um, I think that's, I, there, I could say plenty more about all of this, but maybe we, we move on one. Well, that segues nicely, Phil, into um, the, the value of playing music together, um, both as a cu communal experience, but also to as a research technique, right? Um, I know one of the more recent comments is from Joel Rubin. Joel's here. Joel was- um, Oh, hi, Joel. Uh, Joel was one of Phil's examiners for his PhD. So he's one of the people here who has read uh, the entire early iteration of the text. Um, well, uh, just before you carry on then, maybe this is a good moment to also thank Joel who, uh, whose comments on that initial draft of the PhD improved it massively, were extremely insightful, yeah. very generous and very um, detailed. But then also, Joel, very kindly, I have an appendix in this book, which is a brief history of klezmer music, and Joel very kindly went through that and provided corrections and clarifications. So thank you very much indeed. Oh, well, thank, thank you, and thanks for writing the book. It's really great. I read. I had, I had to read through the book too, so I've been through the whole thing at least twice. Okay. <laughs> uh, but so, so thinking about you're, you were you talking about playing music together, Phil. Um, just tell us a little bit about how you used performance as a research technique. You 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 came in as to, to this process as a klezmer musician, um, and I mean it's it's hard to see how you could have um, developed an emic perspective on this without being able to play at all of these sessions. So tell us tell us a little bit about about that. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Um, I mean, there's a few things to say about that. It's uh, it, it obviously it gives you an in. There's a practical element to being a, a musician if you're if you're studying music as well. And some people, such as uh, Dan Khan and Franka Lampa, I had met before uh, in other musical contexts, so there was already a connection. And obviously, you can. And I hadn't met anybody else, and everybody I met was unfailingly generous and you know and, and open and welcoming. So that I'm sure that would have been the case if I hadn't met people already. But it just gives you a certain level of confidence, which I think is very useful when you're in a new, you know, a new environment trying to trying to talk to people and trying to make connections. Um, but I think I mean that's a practical level, obviously. I think there's a more there's a more important thing, which is that you need to if you're researching something you need to ask questions obviously you know this is like howard sociologist howard becker's thing if you if you view something long enough and you ask enough questions it will become interesting you know becker looked at a uh, at a motor mechanics garage down the road and found a whole ecosystem of kind of power relations and responsibility and things like that so you need to ask questions you need to talk to people and that is one hugely important element of research obviously but music is is a very embodied and effective process and we you know we talk more and more about this now um, about the affective dimension of music and i think being able to kind of feel that and share that with people when you're or, or even feel that going on amongst other performers that when you're not a part of it it adds um, a very important dimension to to the research process um, even though that's sometimes hard to convey you know, it, it can be it, it's very hard to write about affectivity in a kind of convincing way. But I think it informs your own uh, researches and it informs the questions you're asking and it informs the relationships that you make. I mean, any I'm sure that this is the case if you're a dancer or a filmmaker or an actor or, you know, maybe an engineer or a, a physicist or anything else. But there are particular ways of being within your within your chosen world. and. There are particular ways of being musically in the world in terms of body language, in terms of response, in terms of um, discourse that feel very familiar no matter what kind of musical environment you're in, or at least give you a way of, of uh, kind of offering an alternative to a musical environment if it's an unfamiliar one. And so I found that really hugely helpful. And I suppose also the other thing is that just on a purely personal level, you. I, when I, I moving from music to academia or incorporating academia into my life, you know, blew my mind. Wonderful uh, meeting people like you, Alana, and, and just kind of understanding that way of thinking about music. It it, it uh, uh, expanded my thinking and it expanded my uh, way of thinking about music. But if you're doing that, you don't half miss the playing as well. I mean, that's a really that's an important. The same way we're all missing gigs now. I mean, this is not nothing. This is like this is a real, it's a loss. <laughs> and so, if you, uh, you know, if you're researching and, and thinking in an academic way, to have that physical embodiment as well is a really necessary parallel. Uh, I certainly found it so, and it's a different sort of grounding, I think, which is really important. You know, being a researcher can feel a little bit weightless sometimes um and so this is very grounded 
I think. Same way as, you know, researching while having a family there. I know that's a, a, an increasingly hot topic for ethnomusicologists, and I, I would second that. Well, I would say tell us about it, but um, <laughs> <laughs> tell us a little bit about that for anyone here who's had to take children with them on field work. Oh, it was, um, it's great. I, I would recommend it, really. Um, I mean, it makes it much harder in a way, especially if you, you know, you're, you're st our, our son Sammy was two when we were out in Berlin. So I would get back from jam sessions at three in the morning, you know, where maybe a drink or two had been had. And then Sammy would come and jump on my head at half past six in the morning. But that's, you know, that's, that's parenting anyway, wherever you are. Um, but I think the groundedness was important, actually, because you have to be engaging with the city in a different way. You know, you have to be engaging with the life of a city in a different way. You're not you're not floating. You have to. It's the, the groundedness of, of parenthood generally. You know, if you're you can't there's certain things you can't be worrying about when you have to be worrying about changing a nappy. So and maybe that's enough telling you about that. <laughs> Great. Well, I would also say it's um, you know, lots of ethnographers arrive in a city and say, Great, how am I going to meet people? And you sort of had two automatic ends. You never had to do that awkward standing at the side by the band to say, can I talk to you for five minutes? You were in the band, but also taking your child to the playground, you wind up talking to people automatically. Um, absolutely. Um, yeah. So talking about, about sort of groundedness, um, tell us a little bit about um, sort of intellectual, your intellectual grounding um, and how it's changed over the last 10 years that you've been working on Klezmer. Sort of what are the, the texts that have, that have impacted you the most? You just mentioned Howard Becker. Um, obviously, Mark Slovin is here. Yeah, um, well, I was going to say two, two of the two of the authors are right here in this uh, in this meeting. So, um, yeah, I mean, talking about Klezmer music. So Mark Slovin's work is absolutely you, you can't I don't think you can think about talking particularly about contemporary klezmer practice and and not find that seminal um but i mean not just because he was the first person to write about uh klezmer music in that kind of meaningful way contemporary klezmer practice but also the particular way that that mark approached things and i think there's a particular thing there's there's a kind of very deep historical research going on um there is a tying of um of material culture to the kind of networks of uh, musical dissemination and transmission, which is really understood at a very kind of deep level um, and and feeds in to the narrative often that, that Mark is, is creating. Um, and then there's often really kind of detailed, but precise and very pertinent interview material. Um, and that's, you know, those three things really are, I, for me, that that's like a model for ethnomusicology. I mean, if you can if you can marry those three things together, I think it's uh, it's phenomenal. I go um, so um, my our neighbor and my good friend uh, Paul Gilroy, the sociologist, was uh, he was in wherever Mark was, Harvard or Yale, for uh, a few years, and they became friends. And when Paul gave back, he gave came back. He gave me a copy of Tenement Songs, um, and I was in my early twenties, and I was you know I was hooked on on Mark's uh, work since then. So hugely important within klezmer history more generally. Well, Joel. Rubin and um, Zev Feldman, the a kind of, you know, twin titans of, of that sort of history for me. Um, and as I've said, I've said that I've talked about the influence of Joel's work on mine, and that's uh, hugely important. Um, but I think, I mean, my first degree was in cultural studies, and that has always been a really important influence on my thinking. That's the first thing that excited me academically. Was cultural studies um and so particularly then uh you know the work of someone like dick hebditch uh, talking about subculture talking about culture as a the again this relationship between material culture musical uh communication and social process i think someone who can unpack that as skillfully and as as kind of wittily as hebditch is really always worth knowing about um and uh, you know the the work of the birmingham contemporary uh, center for cultural studies generally but of course stuart hall who was the you know kicked that whole thing off um and stuart hall for so many reasons uh was, was important in my thinking and and remains so and he's a bit like you know you've got them and there's a good album and you forget about that album and you suddenly listen to it again after about seven or eight years and you think, oh, wow, I forgot how much I like this. Well, I, that Stuart Hall's writing is, is a bit like that for me. Um, but if one was to try and find some things which are, I think are really important is, uh, first of all, it's so bloody readable. It's, you know, we write as academics, we, I think we can forget that we're hopefully writing books that people, first that they're gonna read, but they're gonna enjoy reading. 
you know they're going to actually find thrilling and Stuart's writing is is witty it's dynamic it's engaging so I think on that level um, on a theoretical level I think his advocacy for um, the importance of popular culture as a site of negotiation as a site of struggle over meaning as a site of struggle over class race gender identity not not in an antagonistic way but in a way that's what Stuart was, was often arguing is that that's what propels popular culture forward that's what keeps it dynamic is that kind of dialogue that's going on and and the fact that it doesn't sit still you know when popular culture is just a kind of agreed and static space then it kind of becomes pretty boring um, and so his you know very politicized work in always unpicking that uh, I find amazing and then uh, when I started doing this research a real new discovery to me um, was the spatial uh, kind of geography work of people like Henri Lefebvre and uh, Michel de Certeau particularly those two um, and the understanding which I found revolutionary and still do, and it feeds a lot into the book actually, is this idea that space is not something that we just move through in a neutral way. Uh, space is something that is produced um, and something that, uh, you know, that, that is formed by the different activities that are going on within it. And so when you're thinking about, you know, Jewish, traditional Jewish musical practice within the spaces of contemporary Berlin, that understanding of a sense of the production of space and that dialogue uh, becomes really important. So th that's that's some of the people that I've um, become uh, and continue to be influenced by. I am having a flashback to the early days of the project when we were describing you as a, a, a klezmer flaneur. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, well, okay. So you make this sound wonderful. I mean, why would why wouldn't we all go and do projects about klezmer in Berlin? Why don't you tell us a little bit? Bring it. Uh, bring us down to earth for a second. Why don't you tell us about some of the challenges you encountered in your research? There. I, I mean. I mean. I do mean logistical. Um, logistical problems. Obviously, you're a British musician it was very easy for you to go to Berlin. It would not be as easy for you to go to Berlin now, right? Um, yep. Logistical problems, um, access problems, even intellectual problems as you were figuring out the project. Um, I didn't find too many challenges. Uh, I, I mean, I think it did, it really helped that this younger community of musicians was forming and, and really, I think it was my impression, was really starting to understand itself as a community. And so it was a real, I remember uh, hearing a talk from uh, the ethnomusicologist Jeff Baker, and he was saying when you, if you're in a new place, trying to find things, find people, find the bottleneck, you know, find the bit where everyone's forced into a, a, a kind of collision with each other. And that bottleneck might be uh, a venue so there were a number of venues in, in Berlin that I, well, Oblomov we talked about, but there were a number of other ones. Uh, sadly, some of them have closed, like Café Burger and these kind of places where you, you find the, the place where people congregate and you just kind of, you make yourself congregating within them. So I suppose one of the challenges is to know what places those are, but we're in a very connected world now. It's not it's not too hard to, to kind of see what's going on there. Um, I think the challenge for me, you mentioned about flaneuring. Um, one of the possibly the intellectual challenges is you think you're trying to you know you're trying to grasp the city and you think am i actually grasping the city or am i just you know wandering leisurely along the the canal and maybe they are very similar things but it can be quite hard to know that difference so i think logistically in terms of you know making a research plan it's not all that easy to incorporate flaneuring um, in your research plan and so you have to kind of be alert to those possibilities but in general I don't think uh, there were some intellectual challenges that the the standard ethnomusicological issue about how do you integrate musical uh, analysis into the kind of larger frame that you're talking about what, what how, how do you stop those musical examples just be being like a um, you know an interlude you say great we've had some theory now let's listen to some music and you know i don't mind that idea but it's nicer if you can actually focus in but i found in that a lot of the musical examples that i uh used helped me think about the wider picture um, i mean the work of someone like dan khan is frequently confronting the issues that i you know more generally am writing about in the book so i don't think the challenges were too were too terrible um i think largely i was you know i, I was lucky um and found some really fascinating people and some good scenes, uh, you know, and was welcomed in 
and people had a lot to say. That was that that did strike me. I, I had I had a slight worry that people wouldn't. This was my first time doing this kind of interviewing, but then Sasha Lurie actually when we met, she made the point that this is often a scene where people don't accidentally find themselves. People have kind of they've been bitten, um, and so they're likely to have a lot to say. <laughs> Um, also, they're Jewish, so um, so they have a lot to say. What, some, how of did them. You, some of them are, uh, some of them are. Yeah, ab absolutely. T talk to us about that. How did you navigate the Jewish thing? Um, your own Jewishness, the Jewishness of the scene, the sort of discussion about what's happening to Klezmer in this very particular context. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. I was... Um... I was aware that the, the Jewishness had often framed the whole debate, the Jewishness or the non-Jewishness, perhaps more accurately, you know, the Jewish absent, this 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 kind of supposedly uh, gaping aporia at the middle of all this excited uh, Jewish folk music going on, there, which is not, I don't think that, I mean, someone like Alan uh, could speak to this much more, but, uh, and Joel, but I, I got, the, I never got the feeling that was it was quite as as uh, binary as that. I always felt a lot more nuanced um, in that sense. I think the Jewishness. Um, I was aware not to go in with an agenda there. I was trying not to go in with an agenda, but I was also aware that some of the new arrivals to the city were kind of making Jewishness much more a part of their work. Again, talking about someone like uh, Dan Kahn, but then also even more recently now. Um, I had a chat with Craig Udelman and, and Sasha Lurie uh, just a few weeks ago for a chapter I'm doing on this similar theme. And it became apparent that a sense of Jewishness um, or Jewishness is maybe one would better say uh, is much more a part of the kind of klezmer and Yiddish musical practice in the city now um, and maybe a slightly more relaxed and uh, wider ranging sense of Jewishness. Um, and I was definitely aware of that beginning when I was there. Um, my own Jewishness, uh, I don't know. I, well, I mean, it, the project wasn't about my own Jewishness, uh, but it did make me think about it, it which was OK. I, I mean, I come from the like the North London left wing Jewish <laughs> liberal intelligentsia. That's my that's my yichas, and I'm, I'm proud of them. Uh, and so, but that's often been very kind of secular uh, Jewish thought and secular Jewish practice. And in a way, that chimed, that resonated, I think, very well with the sort of explorations of Jewishness that I was finding in Berlin. So it allowed me to think about mine, but I didn't, I, I don't, mine didn't kind of come into my research too much, I would say, because I, it wasn't, it wasn't about me in that way. Certainly not that bit of me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm reading really interesting comments that are coming yeah, in. Yeah, I'm same. seeing this. I'm seeing all these comments go by all the time. I'm going to have to presumably you'll, you'll catch up. You'll I can scroll. look at the chat at some point. <laughs> Absolutely. I know that I know that also Alan has a has a story he'd like to tell about, I presume, the encounter with Kazbek. So that would be great. Uh, it'd be great to have that in if we can at some point. We, let's do it now. Alan, let's Alan, let's find hey, it. everybody. Thanks. First of all, Phil, um, I love the presentation you're doing and also Ilana. We don't know each other as well, Ilana, but Phil and I know each other pretty well. And uh, I love your writing and uh, thank you for the careful attention you gave to the scene. I, I'm, I'm thinking about um, how unbelievably contingent things are in history, even things that turn into something which is big and it's hard to imagine that it could ever have gone any other way. But since you mentioned Kazbek, I wanna say that when I came to Berlin in 87 in the summer, I had stopped playing closure music completely for a few years because I, I found that it had become repetitive and uncreative in the United States. And um, that was at least in the scenes that I was in. And uh, about three, four days after arriving in Berlin, I went to a concert of Greek music here in Berlin. And um, they were playing uh, a Zembekiko. And of course, most of the Berliners were clapping every second beat, which doesn't work very well in the Zambekio. And there was one guy across the room who was clapping. He was beating, you know, clapping the right beat. So our eyes found each other and he comes over to me. This is like three days after my arriving in Berlin, terrified about being there and thinking, am I going to survive being here? Or was it, I'm not used to being away from home in Germany, which was scary and all that. He says to me, aren't you Alan Byrne? I went, what? <laughs> Who are you? And he says, well, I'm Andreas Karpin, and I, I play in this band, which is called Kazbek. And I, rec and I said, so how do you know me? And he said, well, I recognize you from the Klezmer Conservatory Band cover, which was one of two LPs that was available of Klezmer music in, uh, in Berlin in those days, the other one being from um, Capella. 
he said, listen, we've got gigs all summer long. Would you like to play with us? And I thought, whoa, this is like the best possible thing that could happen to get to know Berlin from the inside. And that got me started to play klezmer music again. And then shortly after that, Joel called me up and, and also completely contingent. His duo had just broken up and he needed somebody to play with. And he said, well, Alan, you know, would you like to join me? I have some concerts. And yeah, and then Joel, maybe I can set up some concerts for us in Berlin. And this whole scene actually started, at least for me, because of this encounter with a non-Jewish German band that had been playing Russian music and happened to get this one LP of the Klezmer Conservatory band. And the guy happened to be at the concert that I happened to be at. And, you know, like all of this stuff, the people who have learned Klezmer music and the workshops and Weimar. And I mean, none, I think none of that would ha have, have happened without that completely chance meeting. And that's just incredible when you think of that, um, the degree of contingency that goes into, you know, huge, huge historical things. I, I just wanted that, to share that. No, I think it's a great, thank you for sharing it. That story is in the book as well. And I think that- Oh, um, it is, okay. Yeah, but it's fine. It's great you shared, it's wonderful. It's nicer to hear it, you know, in, in real time. Um, but it's, I think you're right about that degree of contingency. And um, in a way, I find that the contingency quite comforting um in that you know you can only be so you can only plan so far and you can only and i guess right now you know we're all about contingency aren't we everything that goes on is about contingency at this particular historical moment but in terms of musical you know you you can put the you can put the star on your door and and want to be look at it every day and think what am i doing to make myself a star but knowing that it's always going to be about the contingency of, of your musical encounters day by day i i find that very kind of grounding personally um, so yeah, but thank you. Great story. Um, I love that. Um, but also, Phil, that reminds me of this co this theoretical concept that you incorporate into the project a lot of bricolage, right? Um, you talk to us a little bit about bricolage. Yeah, sure. Um, so I found bricolage. Oh, look, here's Michael Alpert as well coming in. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think Berlin is a city of bricolage. Uh, bricolage is, uh, is, is um, as a theoretical idea, was formulated by uh, Claude Levi-Strauss, and he, ta he uses it, he's um, talking about um, uh, myth-making societies. In, in his terminology of the 1960s, we, we have to allow for that, uh, as known as primitive um, myth-making societies, who, who create um, narratives and myths from... Uh, from the kind of materials that they have to hand. So rather than an, a top down, you know, uh, God created the world in seven days narrative, it's talking about um, individual little moments um, of storytelling. And this is for Levi Strauss, this is kind of narrative bricolage, but more recently uh, in cultural studies and cultural geography and, and many other um, sort of critical practices, people talk about bricolage as basically creating meaning out of whatever whatever is found rather than saying this is how I see the world and it fits into these like you know like we all live right now in these zoom boxes it doesn't actually look like that it's like little bits of, of moment put together and I think Berlin is very much a city of bricolage probably because of history as well because of being um, you know being the strategic pawn in so many other people's games for so often but also I think that the, uh, in East Germany, and this is my projection, but it feels right, in East Germany, uh, the kind of need to uh, sedimented under the surface histories, to keep them under the surface, engenders a certain bricolage, uh, a kind of, you know, engenders a certain um, cunning, which is part of bricolage. Uh, and likewise, in West Germany, uh, that sort of bizarre, slightly bubble aspect of the, you know, of the supported West German, oh, sorry, West uh, in West Berlin, that, that bizarre bubble of the supported West Berlin city um, kind of in, engenders a certain unreality, which is also can be part of bricolage. But certainly I was aware in my time there that it's there's lots of bricolage going on. So I was trying to think about that musically as well. Um, and there's there might be a few nice examples to talk about um, that I talk about in the book. Um, so one, I think, um, well, maybe think not so much but talking about kind of cross genre is that all right we talk about sort of syncretism a little bit okay so yeah i'm unmuting to say that i sort of think in the way that you frame it i sort of think of those as overlapping concepts in a way so i think musically they, they, they certainly are yeah okay so um i didn't really want to set very firm 
um, sort of genre boundaries around what I was looking at. Um, I think when one thinks about bricolage and diversity, that's that's kind of that's part of the aesthetic, and therefore. Um, to say, well, we have to be very purist in, a, in our definition, I think that kind of misses the point. And I was, I was, I was more interested in the process and less in the kind of um, a top-down definition. So the, maybe there's a couple of musical examples that might, um, that might be worth bringing in for that. Um, I could talk, first of all, um, I think about, uh, they're here today, uh, Sasha Luria and Ilya's band Vorspiel, um, which is actually, I was thinking about this just today walking the dog and I've realized something that I wish I'd put in the book which isn't in the book now so I can I can say this and Sasha Lily you can uh, you can agree with this or not um, it's a they describe it as a Yiddish rock band um, and that is uh, you know that's that's an accurate definition um, but it's not a rock band like um, a contemporary rock what's a contemporary I'm showing my age uh, the Imagine Dragons or someone like that something that my son likes it's not it's not a rock band of now it's actually a retro Yiddish rock band so they sound more like the Doors, or more like Pink Floyd, and I think when you introduce that, when you introduce an idea of retro into Yiddish music, that's actually incredibly sophisticated because it, uh, you know, the, it it becomes about um, nostalgia and desire, but nostalgia and desire which is not Mindstädter um, Belts. It's not the kind of um, cliched shtetl nostalgia which is so often um, associated with Yiddish music. It's a sense of retro, which is very different from a sense of nostalgia. So that feels like a very kind of um, sophisticated uh, syncretism for me. There's another band um, in Berlin that I uh, spoke with and, and like very much called Schmaltz, which is a, and that's a band of Berlin natives, non-Jewish Berlin natives, um, who have created a, a sort of fantasy um, world called Malvonia. And this fantasy world allows them to tap into the kind of cabaret codes of Berlin which is you know which is has often been a, uh, an important part of the city's musical practice um, but without doing so in a kind of corny oh, we're, we're in Berlin we better do some cabaret way uh, because it roots all the, the cabaret into this strange world called Malvonia and it also allows them to uh, particularly Karsten and Detlef, who, uh, who run the band, it allows them to put all their different musical influences and kind of cohere them into one place. And so that's a kind of very nice, powerful example of sort of syncretism and, and bricolage, I think. Um, and then maybe one more syncretic thing, I've talked about him quite a lot already, but the, the work of Daniel Kahn, who is, you know, as, as a lot of us know, is a, a strong kind of mover and shaker within Yiddish uh, musical and, uh, and acting and linguistic circles. But a lot of his musical work also uh, is influenced by a kind of American singer-songwriter ethos, and particularly the the darkness of someone like Tom Waits or um, or Nick Cave. Nick Cave is Australian, not American, but that that kind of darkness um, of the singer-songwriter aesthetic, and and even actually in in the kind of, in its anger, someone like uh, uh, Vladimir Vysotsky. But when you put that into Yiddish music you know putting anger into Yiddish music and darkness into Yiddish music that becomes a very different sort of proposition and that feels very new to me so that that's the sort of syncretism and bricolage I was I was looking at I love that as long as I've got you talking about repertoire this is it's it's it has passed the hour so this will be my last question and then we'll move over to the audience questions um, and there are a lot of them wow yeah. um can you is there can you can you leave us with one piece of repertoire that you encountered or played in Berlin that has that really that really marked you and marked your experience as a musician there? Um, yeah, there's there's lots. Um, yeah, actually, what I was just talking about, I should should probably not have, not have spoken about Dan Khan just before though, because I'm gonna I'm gonna pick one of his songs as well. Um, it's a song called Girl It's a Park, uh, and it's particularly actually. It's it's really good. This is this is one of those things, and I always find this when I do presentations about music, is that you can spend all your time talking, 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 and then you play someone a bit of music, and it's like the lens focuses in, and everyone goes, they get what you're saying. They say, ah, oh, okay, now I can hear it. I can hear it in the music. This is Paul Gilroy's thing about the music never lies. You know, you can you can chat away, but the music always tells the truth. And um, so this song, Girl, it's a park. Um, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful kind of uh, doomed love song. Um, and I, it was particularly meaningful to me because Görlitzer Park is, is a park in Kreuzberg and we would go there, I would go there with um, Sammy, our son, 
almost every day. We would walk along the canal and then go in, into the park and, uh, you know, walk around. And it was this very kind of pastoral, lovely, uh, you know, happy, sunny environment. We were there in the springtime and the summer in Kreuzberg. So we were kind of seeing this beautiful part. You know, there were a few drug dealers around and things, but it was basically like a lovely playground that, that we were in every day. And Dan's song is like the absolute opposite. It's from this kind of lovely park. He conjures this kind of tragic doomed wasteland which uh, importantly is catapults us kind of back into um, the problematic element of German Jewish history uh, and Soviet uh, history as well and so there's all of these kind of undertones in the song actually they're quite explicitly stated in the song but there's undertones within the park itself it's like the the geography of the park holds all these different things and so you know I would be strolling along with Sammy in this lovely playground on the Spielplatz and the swings and things and I'd have this song going on in my head and you have this kind of fabulous contrast it's not a very klezmery song in fact it's not klezmery at all but Dan's work in klezmer Yiddish tradition informs much of what he does uh, in a way it's much more of a sort of chanson I would say like you could imagine it as a I don't know as a PF song or something like that but maybe with a little bit of a of a Yiddishy of a Jewishy kind of twist I won't try and sing it you can find the song yourself and think but what Greg what I particularly has, has hopefully put the link in the chat box so everyone aha, can... brilliant but what I think particularly I like and this is why the music is very useful in focusing is that uh, Berlin and I'm certainly not the first person to make this point is that Berlin exists simultaneously across a number of different histories you know the different histories are kind of overlain the city of berlin this is true of a lot of cities i live in edinburgh which is somewhere that as my friend alan galford likes to say plays fast and fast and loose with time um, itself but in berlin this kind of you know this sense of erasures and overlaying of history and palimpsests and things feels really like built into the architecture and built into the kind of daily life and so this song I was living that experience, you know, walking through this beautiful park and then hearing in my head uh, this kind of tragic, doomed love song about the same space. Um, so that would be mine, particularly. I noticed that someone has, has mentioned Michael Alpert's song, uh, Berlin 1990, as well. So there, there's there's plenty of uh, plenty of things one could pick. But that that was that certainly is one of the meaningful ones to me. Thanks, Phil. I think okay. I think we'll transition directly into questions from the from the audience. Um, we have a very, very chatty audience today, which is fantastic. Um, no doubt testament to your amazing ability to explain things by giving us repertoire and using the word palimpsest in the same sentence, um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is not something you hear every day. So we'll have um, first from, from Niels and then from, from Rachel. So, so Niels asks, um, you know, when we think of Klezmer cities, before your project, uh, apart from the musicians in here who we know, um, one wouldn't have thought of Berlin as a klezmer city. So, so how did you how did you come to the idea of Berlin as um, as the city for the city for this project? Well, it, it has been a klezmer city uh, for um, a number of decades now. Um, and I think, I mean, the reasons behind that are, well, it's, it gets back to Alan's thing about contingency. I mean, there were, there were a certain number of um, important, um, you know, ex immigrant musicians, often American musicians who were there from the, the late 80s onwards um, and were very influential in kind of um, disseminating klezmer musical knowledge and practice. But before then, I think, I mean, speaking with people like uh, Jan Hermerschmidt from Aufwind, uh, who grew up in East Berlin um, and uh, from the early 1980s was, as I said, was kind of piecing together his uh, klezmer musical knowledge with his fellow band members. Um, he, one of his points was that there was a real sense of um, no one was no one was talking about this. No one was saying you know what was going on he said that jews had been part of of german life for for centuries and yet no one was talking about it and one of his ways of doing that was to look into eastern european jewish life now there's a slight disconnect there between the fact that he's talking about eastern europe and this is um you know eastern europe further east than than berlin but at the same time there was certainly um a move to do that and on the part of someone like karsten troika as well in the uh, 1980s um, he was influenced by records that his father Josh Selhorn would bring back from the west and so he was picking up on that a little bit so I'd say it's been a klezmer city for some time now 
what I think happened, um, and there's plenty of people here today that could probably um, deepen this and you know maybe correct me, but what it feels like to me happened is that there was then a wave, what people called the klezmer boom in the 1990s and early 2000s, which did, uh, because it was often um, being kind of peopled by, uh, by non-Jews and, like I said, seemed to point to this Jewish absence in the middle, which may or may not have been true, there was a kind of lot of ideological hand-wringing going on there. But what happened, regardless of that, is that it created a space for the music in the city into which then other people come. You know, it becomes a bigger star in it and it gets a, a larger gravitational field. Um, so I'd say it's been a klezmer city for some time. It's not a historical klezmer city, but there is much more Yiddish culture in, within Berlin and has historically been for many, many years than people give credit for. I mean, there's the, the standard narrative is that Berlin, Berlin Jews have always been westward looking and there is a lot of truth in that. But at the same time, there's been a lot of Yiddish, Yiddish uh, literary um, and linguistic culture there for many, many decades. Great. That I think that that feeds into to Rachel's. Rachel asked a question that's worded so nicely that I'd like it to be read. Rachel, if you want to read it yourself instead of my reading it, you can feel free to unmute yourself and pipe in. But it's such a beautifully worded question that I think it needs to be asked as it is. Um, it says, it says, I love the idea that people, you said this, Phil, get bit when coming to Berlin, to, to Klezmer in Berlin. What a great phrase. I'm curious about how Germans of the non-Jewish persuasion get bit. The reward for getting bit is clear, but how does it happen? Come for the X, stay for the amazing scene. <laughs> um, I Well, would it be different? I, I would question whether it's... Um whether one you know whether you, one needs to be jewish to get bit in a certain way i think i think one could get bit um equally um i i don't know the answer to that i'd say there's many different ways um i think that the fact that one can get bit and then there is a there's a vibrant scene going on is very important i can speak to my own whether well, then I'm, I'm not german and, and i am jewish i'm not sure that answer would work very well but i can speak to what a number of people told me which is also that um, klezmer is, you know, offers an, a number of different ways of identifying if one chooses to use it in that way. One can identify with Jewishness, one can identify with uh, Easternness, one can identify with exotica if one chooses to do that. But on a musical level, it also offers, it's, it's extremely exciting music to play. Um, if one has classical musical training, it, it uses that, but it uses that in a way which is unlikely to have been used before. This certainly is my own experience, but it's not just, I mean, lots of people have said this when I've spoken to them as well. It uses musical training uh, in a way that's unlikely to have been used before. Um, it kind of, it's not quite jazz is, uh, you know, the space in between the notes, but embodied performance is integral to klezmer musical performance in the way that that it is in jazz music and in the way that it sometimes is pushed away from in, in classical music for example so i think people get a bit like that but i don't know maybe someone i mean uh, samuel seifert is here maybe he wants to say how he got bit um or maybe anyone else who wants to take that take that on i think it's a great question rachel i'm aware that i haven't given you a brilliant answer but it's a start maybe it's a it's a conversation starter rather than a, a conclusion well thank you i mean what i was i was thinking when i heard you talking about the scene i was thinking about sort of two sort of sem, i guess semi-analogous musical scenes that one might encounter that have you know, sort of very different auras about them. And one of them is this sort of classic white guys playing jazz in New Orleans, um, which has sort of, it's fun, but there's also problems that go with that. And then there's also the way that shape note singing in the United States, first of all, spread from the deep South to the North and the way that Northerners really approached shape note singing, particularly, in, you know, between the sixties and the eighties as we are coming respectfully to someone else's culture. I mean, it took a long time. And then the way that shape note singing then spread to Europe and the ways that people who didn't ha even, even have that same sort of same passport connection to Alabama, you know, got into that scene. Um, and it, it, it just seemed like this might, this might be something similar. I think you know, how, some... do, how do people sort of get into a world that is maybe still a little bit closed and there's maybe some friction there and how, how does that entry happen? 
Well, I wonder about the friction or the, the closed. I think that's it's a good question that um, I would say one thing that I think the uh, the recent um, scene that I've been talking about quite a lot has taken a lot of care to to try and, uh, you know, get rid of any of that friction or the closeness. And actually, I put have put in with their Stettel, Neukölln Stettel Berlin Festival have, uh, you know, are starting to put in structures which kind of almost ensure that there's a, a new generation coming up. Um, more generally, yes, I think it's possible. There's, there's, I mean, there has often been a, a level of um, what Fabian Schneider called Stettel kitsch. There's often been a level of kind of exotica around mm. Yiddish and Klezmer musical practice that maybe is is a way in for some people, is a kind of, is a slightly you know, exotic, um, spicy way into it. There may be, there may be something in there. I, I haven't probed that too much because actually I was, when I was in Berlin and talking to people, I was kind of, it was um, noticeable by his absence, actually, that mm -hmm. I think I expected to find much more of that than I did. So it might be there, but I, I didn't particularly, it wasn't on my radar. But I mean, maybe I can look again and, and, and ask. But I, I think your examples are interesting. I wonder how much of a parallel they have. Um, it also possibly the thing is that certainly by the time I was looking and, and for, you know, a couple of decades before, we were already talking about a very transnational musical mm -hmm. practice and the the spaces where it's happening are often transnational. So I wonder if how much that sort of um, sampling still uh, still holds. Interesting. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. We have we have a lot of vigorous discussion in the chat from some very 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 high flying musicians about exactly which date um, Klezmer was put on the map in Berlin. Um, I think ah. <laughs> I think Phil. Okay, well, well, so so let's we, we can we can we can flag that and maybe pick it up. But also, I think just it, one of the things that Phil was really excited about for this talk is the fact that lots of the musicians who he worked with. Um, in his research are here. It's such a treat to be able to present one's research to one's uh, research partners. So this might be a, a good moment for um, for people like Ilya to chime in. Um, and and of course, these the Alan and Michael and the other people who are commenting on here in here. Um, it can either be about when 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 Berlin was put on the map or about about other reactions to the project. Um, I know Phil feels really eager to hear from you. Um, yeah, Phil, this is great. I'm, uh, <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. It's, it feels strange to be nostalgic for something that happened seven years ago, at least in, in your <laughs> book, but, um, yeah, that video, you know, everybody looks so much younger and so much closer together than we could possibly imagine this year, but, um, you know, this will come back and in, in one way or another, it will be another revival of the Klezmer revival, you know, the post post pandemic revival, we'll see. But um, yeah, I mean, um, uh, this isn't, I, I just, um, one, one thing that I've been thinking about, you know, like the reason, you know, there are many reasons why uh, this Klezmer kind of, the, 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 uh, the next wave of Klezmer revival um, sort of happened in, um, in Berlin and, but like one of them is, you know, it's economic and it's, it's like Berlin is a place it's, or at least it was a good place and still is, but not as good as seven years ago. Yeah. A good place for musicians to live and to, you know, to make enough, um, you don't have to make a lot of money to to survive um and so that leaves you with with time to make music and there was at the time and still is you know a, just a like a big jamming culture in berlin of there's like you know like a swing jams and um you know reggae jams and all, all kinds of jams so so in a way that was that was a good foundation to you know start a jam and you know, there were some people who were klezmer musicians and there were some people who were not klezmer musicians who would come and some of them would come for like, um, they would come for one session and never come back again. And some of them would come and, you know, get bit and and stay. And it, also, you know, like you kind of, you come, you, you come for the music, but then maybe you stay for the culture or the other way around, you know, and there's, there's a lot of, a, a lot of levels and, um, um, yeah, like uh, you can, um, you don't have to go deeper, 
but at 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 some point you know once you've once you've learned enough about the music you feel like yeah maybe you know the the jewish element is also important in this you know whether you are jewish or not and i i went through this process myself sort of i i i got into klezmer for the music and then um you know but now i realize that if i don't know more about the culture that doesn't like i can't play the music the way i feel it should be played so you know it's it's a long gradual process and um uh, we'll see. I'm I'm glad um, you know. I'm glad that we are um, that we started the sessions, and I'm glad that they're continuing in some form or another. We we did um, you know three three uh, online pandemic um, video sessions where people sent in their videos and and um, Patrick put them together and um, you know as um, and I'm sure this will come back. And also we have a festival and uh, weekly workshops by the way we um the one it's 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 on tuesdays the one uh we uh, we're not doing one today but um you know join our check out our workshops every tuesday at 6 30 berlin time kind of overlaps with this but uh we'll see maybe we can you can have two zoom screens and, and do, i don't know we'll <laughs> see but yeah um yeah I thanks so much point yeah. I think your point um, about the about the kind of different levels of entry is is really important, and I, I wonder if that's something which has also changed and, and loosened up a little bit in terms of um, how people are approaching this music. In I mean, maybe all over, but certainly in you know because you can't you can't pretend that uh, playing Jewish music in Germany is going to kind of come ideology free, is it? There's gonna there's gonna be something there. This is this is. This is territory that's you know full of of landmines really you, one can't avoid that ideological landmines now one can choose to kind of make those um a, a sort of an obsessive focus or one can ignore them completely or one can negotiate them um as one sees fit but i think i definitely was aware in a sort of more relaxed approach to all of that uh, in this kind of newer um, work that you know that people like you and, and uh, Svieta and Patrick and, and Sasha and everybody was doing um, and I think that that felt different to me that felt different from uh, kind of previous approaches uh, so yeah so I mean I, I think to echo the, the idea about the different points of entry is important there great we have a question we have a hand from Sasha please yeah, I mostly, I mostly just wanted to congratulate Phil on this beautiful writing because um, I'm, I'm so moved by how you, how you describe what, like, it's, it's amazing how you found this beautiful way to describe exactly how it feels. Like everything you describes is exactly, it, it moved me enormously, especially these days, I think like when uh we're all missing our community a lot it moved me enormously i didn't realize that it would be such an emotional thing for me and i think you make a great point there about the ease of it and for all of us i think it always has been an important part of it but also as somebody who travels to a lot of yiddish functions around the world i can strongly feel that um, Berlin itself kind of rubs on, uh, rubs off on us because Berlin itself has us, or especially these parts of Berlin, like Neukölln, uh, have like a certain ease to them. And people tend to be a little more relaxed and more open to things. So having a session in a bar made it available to other people and made these different points of entry possible like Ilya said but it's also part of the culture of the city to be that way that definitely has played an enormous role here to the question of how why Berlin even though Berlin does have a long Yiddish history that I'm sure people in the comments have um, mentioned okay. that's Thank you, Sasha. That's it's, it's lovely to hear that, that that it moves you, and that makes that that makes me very 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 happy to hear. Uh, so thank you for saying that. Um, 
I that's actually the that's the most nervous thing, you know, putting like you can you can put your stuff out to to an, a whole booth, bunch of anonymous people. If you put it out to the people who are involved, you you know, to to hear it affects that's wonderful. Um, I think that uh, that ease is important, and and the uh, you know a lot of people did mention this, and and as Elia said, there's there's a in fact uh, Craig, your partner was saying that you know not so long ago that it's there's something much less uh, sort of cliquey in that way. Hi Craig, uh, than other possible places. Um, and I think that really is important and it allows for a sort of fluidity, um, which really is what I was I was picking up on um, very much while I was there and, and then writing about. Um, can, can, I, can I just quickly, I, I don't want to take too much time on this, but I, uh, you know, Sasha just sort of pointed out, you know, the reason why Berlin, but also I feel like it's important to, to point out why, class, why, why or rather why uh, the sessions, you know, like why do we do Klezmer jam sessions and not Klezmer workshops or Klezmer concerts, which which is also part of it. But I, I find I'm a big proponent of jam sessions as a tool and as a format for, you know, for learning and for teaching and for community building kind of purposes. Where And I feel like you know, in the absence of the traditional functions of klezmer music, such as wedding music, and also like the broader, like, you know, even if you get klezmer at weddings, it will be, you know, very kind of small part of a wedding, and you wouldn't get the full spectrum of, uh, you know, klezmer genres played at weddings, for example. But I feel like, you know, a, a jam session is in a way sort of a new, a new kind of format for klezmer music for for it to exist and to kind of um develop in a natural way because um you know the yes you can have and you should have concerts and you should have kind of more organized type of uh playing klezmer but also this kind of spontaneity and the element of surprise that comes in with you never know how who will show up you never know how long this will go and you know how loud it will be and you know, and you kind of have to navigate it in real time. I feel like that really, you know, that really brings out the that that folky, you know, folky um, improvisational element in it. So, you know, do more sessions, not just klezmer, anything, but you know, specifically for klezmer, I feel like this is, you know, it's helpful, even if it's not perfect. It's good if it's not perfect, but like I think it's, it's a, a process so yeah there's a there's a i mean that's those are musical things you're pointing at Elia, which i agree with i think there's also a social element isn't there which is that jam sessions are in this fantastic liminal zone you know they're not quite a gig they're not quite a rehearsal they're not polished performance if you see a jam session and you can always spot it you know if you're at a jam session and say a a trio arrives they're playing in town and, and they sit and join and they play one of their sets then that's not that's not a jam session anymore. That's a group performing at a jam session, which is a very different sort of thing. So I think if we're talking about these kind of more fluid, um, you know, ways in at different levels, then I would agree that you're talking about the musical possibilities. But in terms of the kind of social and cultural possibilities, I think the jam session is the perfect format for that because it's 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 a very fluid and very kind of indeterminate way of music making, and it's. You know where we started this talking about the Neukölln sessions with this kind of bleeding between the audience and participants is very hard to draw the line there. Those kind of things are really um, are really what this sort of dis uh, discovery is about. So yeah, in, Phil, in agreement. I just would like to add, if I might, that actually jam sessions are an extremely important part of what we do in Yiddish summer Weimar, uh, yes. like four nights of the seven. Uh, the point being for people to have an opportunity to just in a completely informal and public way, hang out with each other, you know, decompress from the hard work during the day. And actually, Ilya has has been like one of the great jam session leaders in Yiddish Summer Weimar over the years. Another great, great jam session leader, someone who, who helps people have enormous fun and at the same time is teaching them all the time is Kurt Bureling. I'm sorry that he's not here because he was also a very important presence in, in Yiddish Summer of Amor, and he does that in a great way. And there's some other people here who are just great jam sessions. Patty and and uh, Craig were leading jam sessions last year. And that that whole issue of, of like having informal context in which to just try stuff out and the mixing of the social and the formal learning and everything is super, super important. So I, I completely endorse what Ilya said there. 
Yeah, and I think the I, I I do too, and I think the important thing about those Neukölln sessions, if you think about that context of the Stammtisch and the Seitams that we talked about, they are jam sessions, but there are certain levels of gatekeeping and and quality control there, which maybe I mean that might produce uh, interesting musical results, but I think it cuts down a bit of that sort of social fluidity. Uh, and I was really interested talking with Hampus and Ilya and Emil about when they were putting these sessions together is that it was really quite a conscious choice to try and promote this level of uh, of ambiguity and kind of liminality in, in what they were doing. Great. So we have questions first from Elisa and then from Martin. I am well. sorry. I hope you can hear me. Um, so maybe um, Sasha or Craig or someone else of you could also talk about um, what's happening right now. I think you won't have covered that in your book, Phil. Um, no, but for me, being in a small university town in southwestern Germany, it's a really cool development that Städtel Berlin, as it is now called, is going online because this week I can also participate. And maybe it, I don't know how, how in how far it has changed range of participants, but it would be in interesting to talk about that. Yeah, maybe some, someone's typing fr frantically here. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, uh, maybe Sasha and Craig, uh, do you want to talk a bit about the festival going online? Sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always happy to do that, even though we, we've, we're definitely happy that it's online and we can do it and we can bring it to people who are not in town, even though we do miss the in-person thing. I think what we've been doing is we've been looking for ways to help people be part of our sessions in various ways, because often people say that they can't join because they don't feel like they know enough to join or things like that. So we were kind of planning to start little tune learning series before the sessions anyway so kind of uh that's what we're doing we right in the end it's actually yeah it's not been so many of our berlin people that have shown up but people from other places in germany and around the world which is also you know it's great uh although it's interesting how it becomes a bit of a different community and maybe that means that people will be uh coming to our events from out of town you know like our friend and supporter like one of the german klezmer heroes uh hannah ochner um has been she's based in stuttgart which is a long way from berlin and she would just hop on a bus come for the session and then take the night bus back to stuttgart after the session because she has to work in the morning and she's like a physicist and a smart person um so you know it's it's wonderful that people can join a community from afar that way but we hope that when we open back up people will know we're here and what we're doing and we'll be able to yeah i have some other comment about the folk and the jam and the culture thing but maybe let the people ask the questions if there's time i'll make that later okay you'll be you'll be next after martin okay craig <laughs> great um martin please Okay, yes, but there's this little hand to just next to my head. Okay, anyway, <laughs> it first of all, it is so good to see everybody, really. I, it, it just makes me makes me so happy. And um, I, you know, one of the things that occurred to me, um, I've been married for many years to uh, a, a, a wonderful woman who uh, plays Irish music and has played Irish music uh, for about forty years, I think. and um, the Irish, of course, have had this tradition of the session, usually in a pub, going on for many years. And I wonder, uh, Philip, if uh, I haven't read your book, I'd love to read it now. <laughs> but um, I, I wonder if you look, have looked at that ongoing tradition of the Irish session and, and then looked at how it maybe has impacted uh, the the um, sessions in the, in the Klezmer community and the Yiddish music community. And uh, also um, other venues for sessions. I mean, uh, there are pubs. We've done some sessions here in, uh, in the Portland, Oregon area 
uh, of course, before COVID at the, uh, the senior home, the Jewish senior home here in town. And that was a lot of fun too. And uh, often, you know, you discover musicians that uh, so they'll come up to you and they'll say, oh, well, yeah, I, I played that music many years ago. Anyway, enough for me for now, Philip. Did you have any comments about that or anyone else who may have, have a comment about the Irish session as a model and, uh, and how I, maybe I could... that's influenced this? Well, I could certainly talk to that in, in relation to the, the Neukölln sessions that we've been talking about in, in that they're actually quite different, I would say, as a model. Hmm. Um, I mean, the the sort of classic Irish session uh, can be fantastically um, lively and inclusive and, you know, and can incorporate um, dozens of musicians. Uh, but it's almost always I, I've never been to an Irish session where the players are standing up, for example. Hmm. Um, as Sasha just said, in an Irish session, you can hear the fiddles. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's, I mean, there's always around the classic Irish session, you know, around a pub table, um, this kind of thing. I think that same sense of liminality is there, uh, although I, certainly I would find that in Irish sessions, you there's a certain regularity of uh, participants, um, which may be. The, these sessions are a little bit more kind of open to different participants. Um, I think, again, talking with the, the people who, who set these Neukern sessions up, there can be, with Irish sessions, there can be a certain uh, set, set of what um, Neil McKinnon calls hidden rules, um, despite the avowedly open um, practice, which is definitely there, you know, and, and really well meant. There can nevertheless still be um, a certain amount of hidden rules. And I think that one of the amazing things about these uh, Neukölln sessions is their real attempt to dispense with those hidden rules. So I'd say there's some differences in terms of session practice generally. Yeah, it might be interesting to to look at, at where they overlap. Um, I guess an Irish jam session is often quite a formalized space these days, I would say. Um, you know, I think there's a certain regularity every week in the same pub, the same players, this kind of thing. So I wonder how much that would play in. But I don't know. I mean, as you can tell, I'm kind of busking this one. So I might need to look at it uh, a little bit more deeply. But thank you for the question. Really interesting. Sure, okay, thank, in thank you. Box. Lots of comments in the chat box about okay. it. So we've got some experts here. Uh, let's let's come back to Craig and then, then we'll go to Alex now. Cool. Yeah, that's actually exactly the kind of thing I was going to talk about. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd love to hopefully I will soon read the book and find out if you do get into this. Um, but I've, I've been working on an article for this Weimar related YHIP thing, um, dealing a bit with folk music and, and folk culture and like the old time scene and the Irish scene, that whole thing. Um, and one of the things that I've really been trying to investigate kind of is like, you know, we talk about klezmer music as Ashkenazi instrumental music. Um, but I think as most, a lot of people here know, klezmer is, it wasn't really folk music. It's the professional music played for weddings by, you know, members of a guild, and it's it's really a different thing than, than, you know, the kind of music that most Irish or old time fiddlers who would, you know, get home from work and play tunes. Um, and so in a way, it's also less suited to a jam session and the way that we play in a jam session isn't the way that you would play it in a traditional setting. Um, so it's, I think it, it's kind of interesting how it's also evolving like a modern folk culture of this music that isn't really it's not recreating the culture that it was in um and it's you know sort of its whole other thing that's welcome for enough ethnography and work like what you're doing um and i don't know part of what i'm curious about is if we've erased a bit of the ashkenazi folk music by using the word klezmer to describe ashkenazi instrumental music and you know there definitely wasn't the same kind of folk scene or whatever as there was but also with irish music like there didn't used to be sessions or old time sessions you know it's all kind of a modern revival thing. And in, in the old day, you know, you were more likely to pass a fiddle around and everybody played it too and other people listened. Um, so I don't know, some thoughts. Well, I wonder if that's, yeah, really interesting thoughts and I'd be interested to read the article. Um, I, I think that um, there is a, and this has been raised a few times in the chat already, there's a sense of playing into a nostalgia for something which was maybe, you know, was not there at all in the first place. And I wonder if that jam sessions are sometimes thinking about these, you know, are, are that's lurking in the background of jam sessions, you know, this idea of when everyone would just sit down and play before we could do all these other things. Um, so I think you're right to make the point that, uh, you know, this is actually possibly quite a new phenomenon that we're talking about. 
but it's 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 important i mean the fact that we're talking about it so much over this this last 10 minutes or so shows that it's really a kind of a crucial and interesting space and the point that's just been made again by a few people by uh, by patty and by um joel and so on that you know this the Ilya made about the fact that berlin in general is a kind of jam session town that's part of the musical fabric in a way that it might be um not so much in other places okay dr alex knapp please hi uh first of all brilliant presentation from philip and ilana thank you so much i really found it very stimulating um i apologize for having had to miss some of the early part because of a work phone call that came through so you may have covered this and so if so then i'm sorry that i missed it um but i was wondering about the relationship with roma musicians in berlin um because Roma and Klezmer have had such a long, centuries long um, relationship um, musically and socially in all sorts of other ways. And I'm just wondering whether you could comment on aspects of that relationship um, as you may have found them in Berlin in the current period. And um, also, I know that um, Isabel Gantz is art wanting to ask a question, so I'm sorry I jumped in before her, but I would love to hear her question too afterwards. Uh, thanks, Alex. No, I didn't cover it. Um, I, I can't speak much to that. I didn't find much evidence um, of contemporary uh, connections um, between Roma musicians and, uh, and Klezmer musicians, but if Alan is still on, then he put together a project um, called The Other Europeans um, of about when was that? That would be getting on for nearly 10 years ago now, um, which was looking specifically at those uh, those musical connections. So there is certainly work being done to look at that. In terms of the on-the-ground uh, musical life of Berlin, I didn't find uh, much connection at all, but I, I would really hand over to someone else who might be able to answer that question better than me, uh, if anyone would choose to. Ilya says that he jammed with... Django Reinhardt's granddaughter. There you go. There's some yeches for you. I mean, I mean, there is, uh, you know, there always was, and I hope there still is, a sort of a uh, jazz manouche uh, scene, which, um, you know, it's not. I don't think it's, let's say, ethnically Roma, um, but it's definitely some of, you know, Roma music heritage or Manouche music heritage. But uh, yeah, Django Reinhardt's great granddaughter or some relatives used to run, uh, have a, her own concert series and jam sessions in Cafe Burger seven years ago. So yeah, there's that. I don't know more. <laughs> well, yeah. Is there, maybe. Yeah. Also, I, th uh, I think none of us are at all experts on this, um, but I would say there's more Sinti people than Roma, I believe, at least traditionally in Berlin. And there have been occasions when when a like accordionist of whichever heritage would come into the session on like when they're on a round busking, basically, and like come in and play some tunes and like try to pass the hat. And it's always it's a funny it's experience, a but we try to sort of roll with it and sometimes try to play with them or something. But we kind of also have the rule that we don't charge for it. So it 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 sometimes gets a little hairy but it's a great kind of example of like you know a sort of revival revitalization whatever new approach to the culture interacting with you know a related and sort of in some ways more traditional approach to it in the same room you know yeah they always find themselves quite like when they come in they always find themselves a little surprised how people are suddenly following uh when they start playing like Romanian music or whatever. And uh, that's always an interesting it's, thing it's to notice. Moment. It's yeah. always a good moment. <laughs> um, Joel, Joel has added to that. Uh, Alan, did you, did you want to add to that too? Yes, two things. Um, you know, the Roma musicians who had a connection with Klezmer music, which we call them Lautari musicians, they were urban musicians. And the, the Roma musicians that tend to come through Berlin and play um, on the streets are, are not generally um, Lautari musicians from urban centers, places like, like uh, Chisinau and, and so forth. So we're talking about different classes 
Um, class is an extremely important issue in all of this, by the way. And that leads me to actually the second remark. You know, those of you who have read Zev's book, um, and there are other books here too that go into this. Uh, Hank Snetsky has a great book about this, and Joel's book, latest book, is fantastic. I'm reading that. Know that there's a there's a, a strong there used to be a very strong um, class consciousness um, and a consciousness of hierarchy and order and uh, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, especially in the um, Jewish music world um, in northeastern uh, Europe, in, in Poland, as opposed to in Bessarabia and Moldova, where there was less of that organization, exactly because there were Lautari musicians there. And so one didn't have the same kind of control over that particular group of musicians. Um, but I think that one of the really extremely interesting things about the Klezmer um, Neukon sessions, and also this is characteristic of the whole Klezmer music revitalization, is that almost all of us embrace inclusiveness. I mean, the ethos of, of my generation and the people who got into this and the ethos of, of the people who follow us, this is like fundamentally inclusive, inclusive in terms of Jewish, non-Jewish, gender inclusive, sexual orientation inclusive, age inclusive. It's like, you know, in principle, inclusive and, and in this sense, kind of democratic. That's very far away from the, this, the highly differentiated hierarchical structure that places the Klezmer musician, you know, just below the barber, but above the, of the water carrier and things like that. So, um, you know, a lot of the phenomena that you're working with here that you're, that you're uh, mentioning, I think they belong to the sociology, not really of Yiddish music per se, and certainly not of professional Yiddish music, they belong to the sociology of the counterculture and the post counterculture. And, and, um, and one of the things that's so wonderful about Yiddish music is that it offers a very wide spectrum from simple melodies all the way to very complex melodies. It's, it's a, it's, it is a participatory culture. And so in that way, it goes along very, very deeply with countercultural values of participatory culture. And, um, I'm writing now an article about this. I'm using that term of participatory from, from uh, Thomas Torino, I Torino. think his name. If Mark Slobin is here, I'm sure he knows that name. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Torino, yeah. Torino, where he talks about participatory versus presentational culture. And sort of my thesis about this is that in order for, in order for our presentational culture to make sense, which means concerts and things like that, it has to be anchored in a revitalized participatory culture. And that's definitely what's happening in the in the klezmer music sessions. All of those people go to a klezmer music concert, no matter what they've done. If they've only gone to one of those klezmer music sessions with completely different ears than they had before, they had that participatory experience. So, so to sum it up, there's a kind of a of a reorientation of the sociological values um, in this scene, which which I think are not anchored in. The klezmer profession they are anchored in in the counterculture i think that's I'm, I'm really glad to hear you say that alan because i'm also i'm completing a chapter related to the berlin scene where it's looking specifically about community and i'm also making very much the same point that while the the kind of aesthetic connection to um historical performance practice is you know informs a lot of what contemporary musicians do in terms of the collective sense it's a very different sense now obviously we're in a different we're in different worlds different socio-cultural environments but even the actual sense of of the position the musical position vis-a-vis -vis society is a very different one and vis-a-vis -vis fellow musicians so it's good it's good to hear that echoed Great. Can we have um, Isabel, your your question, please? Go ahead. It's not a question. It's something I'd like to share because um, I was living in Amsterdam, 95 through 98, and there was a band there called the Goyim. Niels probably remembers them. They imitated Yiddish and Klezmer brilliantly. And um, I also was hired as a cantorial soloist in Munich. And... Uh, that's in 96 and 97. And there I learned from many of the people in the congregation that they were Russians recently come from the Soviet, some from Russia, not the Soviet Union anymore. And they were conservatory trained musicians. They got to Germany and said, no work. 
what do we do? Well, we could learn from the Goyim. And I thought this was bizarre irony of immigration that these Jewish musicians were learning how to play klezmer from the people who had imitated the Jews so beautifully. I think Simon wrote in the chat that, that there were so many non-Jewish klezmer musicians. And indeed there were, and you probably know better than I how many groups called the Goyim there were in Europe at the time, I think in Germany and in Austria. Correct? Yeah, and they're well, still in- You're getting in, a lot of comments about it in the chat, Isabel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, yeah. well, what a fantastic session, you know. We've got nearly 60 people sitting here, glued to their sets after nearly two hours of scintillating discussion. Thank you so much, Ilana and Philip. And what I would say is, what seems to me is that this was a book waiting to be written. And thank goodness you grasped it and you went there and you did it because you've done it obviously so beautifully. And I can understand that, uh, first of all, I wanted to say that thank, thank you to Joel for suggesting it. So you said that Phil was your first PhD. Uh, uh, Joel was the first PhD uh, at City University. So that was, that's a nice connection as well. And um, it's really shown you what I think is so special about this too, Phil and, and Ilana, is that you're sitting here in a room together with your mentors, the people you interviewed, the people you looked up to, people who've written about you. And and that's what's so special, I think, about these conversations on Zoom is that we can be together in an intimate way and connect, you know, once a week instead of once every three or four years, if we're lucky to go to a conference together. So thank you to everybody, to the wonderful scholars who've been here today in the subject, to Mark and to, to uh, Alan and um, Joel and and the younger generation. It's lovely to see Simon Carlisle. I haven't seen you for ages. Where's the tuba? <laughs> um, and to be reminded of all these tunes and things that we did here. Uh, Andreas as well, I see your, your smile. And what is also wonderful is to see so many people here whose speciality has got nothing to do with klezma. So, you know, this is a community of people who are interested in Jewish music and its interconnections as they go. So may I say in thanking you two that next week we have equally two amazing scholars. We have what I would call a philosopher of Jewish liturgical music. We've got Boaz Tarsi next week talking with Amalia Kedem. And he is talking about, uh, let me tell you exactly what he said. He said, does Ashkenazi synagogue music have a theory? And there's so much to say in this that he asked for two sessions, one next week and one the week after. So the first part is uh, what happens when you do not let the facts confuse you? And the next session is facing the facts. So I'm sure we're in for something really interesting again next week. Next week, again, in the rest of the world, other than America, we are an hour earlier because we only put our clocks forward on the 27th of um, March. So for next week, we're also um, in the earlier time. So it's been lovely that you managed to get here today, even though the time was changed. So can I, can I just come back in on that, Geraldine? Is that is that all right? Just of course. Before, before people leave, just to say, um, it's really, uh, it's, it's really thrilling for me to, um, as as you said, to be uh, kind of the thing today around which all these these wonderful um, scholars who I um, admire musicians who I admire have all kind of coalesced and, and discussed so that's that's fantastic thank you all for the contributions uh, to the book itself and uh, to you know to this discussion which has really been terrific I was quite nervous coming to this so it's lovely to see it um, received so uh, warmly uh, a number of people have asked about buying the book uh, so uh, 
I, I've got very few free copies from OUP, I'm afraid, so you will have to buy it. Now, academic publishing is horribly expensive, but I do have uh, discount vouchers which I can disseminate freely in whatever way I like, So, and there's no limit on that. So if you are interested in buying it, please do contact me through whatever way you, you came to this session, and I will happily send you um, a voucher. Okay, um, if that's all right. And uh, yeah, thank that, you very much that would indeed. Be, that's very helpful. Thanks, Phil, we, because I'm sure many people would want the book and should have it. So um, that's good. You can always write to me. Um, I usually use Geraldine at cantors.eu for these things because COS is partly started by the academic wing of the European Cantors Association together with Mark Kligman at uh, UCLA and Martha Stelmacher, who was with the um, European Centre in Hanover and is now in, in Dresden. And the three of us have sort of set up this forum, which we're so glad that you're on. And do go to Humanities Commons and join the Jewish Music Group because this is the way we can stay connected. You can post about what you're doing you can create new projects. And Martha has already set up a project which you will have gotten notice about if you're on the group, um, where there's a call for papers for a um, conference in Moscow or hosted from Moscow. Uh, let me just find Martha's um, email and I'll tell you about it. Um, where is Martha here? Geraldine is looking things up. Geraldine, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to take chair's action to interrupt you for a minute to thank yeah. Geraldine and Jennifer Jankel for the work that the JMI has done over the decades for, for us Jewish music scholars in the UK. That is a very important thing to say. And I echo uh, the wonderful work that Gil and Jennifer um, have done and are doing for Jewish music for the Jewish Music Institute, absolutely. So, um, the, the very necessary to say. So Martha says, um, session on migration, yeah. She's posted a call for papers on the uh, Humanities Commons, Gula Shamili, who took part in the Hanover conference, picked up our migrations and transformations topic in a conference she's organizing, asked me to organize the section with her. First event on our overarching topic. So um, there is an overarching topic that's called migration and transformation in Jewish music, that everybody's invited to, to do something with, and we're looking forward to perhaps if we can, a conference in Hanover in 2023. So um, just check that out and think about it. Uh, I think migration and transformation in Jewish music covers absolutely everything. So <laughs> it wasn't, doesn't eliminate anybody from doing anything according to that. So yes, we're delighted that JMI is part of the, um, the International Forum for uh, uh, Jewish music studies, a very welcome and wonderful part. And um, great to see Jennifer and Gil here today and for all the support they give to the series. And of course, to Jewish music anyway. So I think that we can say cheerio. And let's give, let's give Phil some applause first, everyone. Big muzzle toe, big muzzle toe, Phil. Thank yeah, you. mazel tov to Phil. It was great. Thank you so much, Ilana. You did a great, uh, a wonderful thing. And if you want to do your own work, you're also welcome to have a session <laughs> when, when you're ready. <laughs> July, July. We've got a, <laughs> one date in July. All my children are back in childcare. You can have any of my time that you want. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Okay. Thanks.